All right, uh, I think we're, it's now time. We have two microphones that work. Uh, my name is Ajay uh, Dandekar uh, from the University of Washington in Seattle, and this is my colleague Ranjani Samyaji from uh, University of Calgary in Alberta. And we're delighted to uh, uh, be chairing this uh, session about the epidemiology and management of infections, and hopefully we'll learn something about how different tools and strategies can be used to understand uh, a variety of different infections that occur in uh, people who have cystic fibrosis. So I'm going to end my me meager slideshow here. And our first uh, talk is by Dr. Jean Gross. And like all the other sessions, if you have questions, please put them in the app, and uh, we'll read them afterwards. Just flick it. Can I control it right here? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jane Gross. I'm from National Jewish Health, and I'll be presenting healthcare associated links in transmission of non tuberculous mycobacteria among people with cystic fibrosis. This is otherwise known as the HALT NTM study. It's not going. Oh, this one. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, I do um, have uh, CF Foundation funding for the work that's going to be presented here today. So for just a little bit of background, uh, NTM can be environmentally acquired from exposures to NTM-laden bioaerosols produced by both soil and water. We also know that healthcare-associated transmission of NTM among people with CF has been investigated at CF centers worldwide. And these investigations have resulted in very conflicting conclusions. So just for some uh, like clarification on wording, I just want to go over some of the wording that I'm going to be using today. So this is a uh, graph of like possible modes of NTM infection transmission. So I want to bring your attention to um, the far right panel. And this is how we historically think of people acquiring NTM infections. Just two people can get NTM from an, their environment, from whatever exposures they're, you know, facing out there in the world. I want to focus on healthcare-associated exposures. So the panel in the middle here is an example of healthcare-associated acquisition um, from a water biosource. So here you have two individuals with CF who have kind of a, a highly related isolate that they both potentially acquired from the healthcare system. That's that's one mode of in common environmental acquisition in the healthcare environment. And on the far left, you see what is uh, considered patient-to-patient -patient transmission. So one patient has NTM and then transmits it to another patient in their same center. So again, when I say transmission, I'm thinking more patient-to-patient, -patient, either direct or indirect. And acquisition is going to be acquisition from the healthcare environment. So the objectives of this study was to systematically investigate healthcare-associated transmission and or acquisition of NTM to determine similarity among respiratory and environmental isolates, and to compare home of residence watershed mapping of people with CF having genetically similar NTM isolates. So this is an overview of the parallel multi-site study design, and I'm just going to walk through this with you. So CF care centers across the country and the US were able to submit NTM isolates to National Jewish for research purposes. And in our hands, all these isolates underwent whole genome sequencing. And we utilized that whole genome sequencing data to identify clusters of NTM subjects that receive care in a single center. We informed centers of these findings, and they were offered enrollment into the HALT NTM. If they accepted, they, individual centers, undergo um, standardized epidemiologic investigation. They also perform healthcare environmental sampling of dust and water biofilms from the hospital and clinic settings. And then we perform final analysis to determine if the source of NTM infection may be a healthcare associated outbreak. So for methods, we had uh, respiratory isolates collected from four different centers, whole genome sequencing was performed, and analysis identified NTM clusters at each of those centers. So now I'm going to show you kind of the flow diagram of an individual center investigation. So we start with the number of NTM-positive people with CF at that center. 
We exclude patients who uh, don't have recurring NTM isolates. So for patients, for example, that have a one-time you know, transient positive are excluded from this analysis. And then we're left with a number of NTM uh, positive patients that undergo whole genome sequencing. With that whole genome sequencing, we're able to identify clusters based on species and subspeciation. Then the individual centers are asked to perform some basic analysis. So they undergo an individual center investigation, a, a traditional healthcare epidemiologic investigation that's guided by a red cap toolkit that we provide to standardize that investigation. Then we move to a, a assessment of environmental uh, acquisition. And so each center then performs their own individual healthcare environmental sampling, again, of dust and water biofilms throughout the clinic and hospital setting. We also perform home of residence watershed mapping of patients that are identified in clusters. And so this means we have used home addresses to map out where patients live and look to see if they live in a common watershed or not. And then finally, we uh, perform a core and pan genome analysis to provide us with our investigational outcomes that we're going to review today. So let's look at the uh, center characteristics of the four centers that uh, participated. So um, across the top, you'll see um, the Colorado Adult Program is center one, and then we have three additional centers here. And you can see that we have a representation of a small center in center two, two medium-sized center in three and four, and um, the Colorado Center is a large program with fi over 500 patients. Next, we want to look at the NTM positivity rate of people within that center. Sorry, I have to adjust my screen here. Um, and what we can see is that it's quite high, actually, in all of the centers. Um, ranging from 19% up to 38% uh, NTM positivity. And this is clearly higher than what's been reported recently in the CF registry. If we look at the patients with CF that underwent whole genome sequencing, you'll see centers 2, 3, and 4 had 100% of their patients were sequenced, meaning they were recurringly positive. In our center, um, it was about 75% that underwent sequencing. Moving to the, the core genome analysis, so the total number of people with C CF that uh, fell within a cluster of those that were NTM positive are shown here. And you can again see it's a lot of people that fell in a cluster that underwent whole genome sequencing, ranging from 26% at center four up to almost 50% at center two. And below this, you can see the total number of NTM clusters that were identified at each center, represented by the number, and below that is the uh, subspecies that we identified and the number of clusters in that subspecies. So here, this is a um, kind of a bird's eye view of phylogenetic trees collected from all the NTM isolates among the people with CF at the various centers that we investigated. And I just want to make a few highlights here. So you can see we, we found multiple clusters of M. obsessus, subspecies obsessus. We also found clusters within what's previously described as a dominant circulating clone one. We also found clusters of M. obsessus, subspecies mycelians. M. avium, as well as M. chimera. And this was a large M. chimera cluster of nine subjects here. So next we start to look at the epidemiologic investigation. So this is what we call a timeline overlap analysis, and I'll just walk you through this. So each cluster is represented by a letter, so you have four clusters here, cluster A, J, D, et cetera. Um, and the subjects in the clusters are numbered in order of NTM positivity. So subject one is always NTM positive first, followed by subject two, et cetera. And I just want to highlight a few things. So this is an example of a clinic visit for this subject. The closed circles here are examples of hospital, hospital stays. And we also represent NTM culture status. So this is an example of NTM culture negative with the blue dash. NTM culture positive with the yellow plus, and then culture positive and smear positive with the red plus. So there's a lot of information on, on these timeline overlaps. I'd like to just highlight one example here. Um, so here this is, in both of these cases, highlighted by the red arrow, you can see that there is a smear positive, culture positive patient, subject one in both cases, who has a, a prolonged hospitalization overlapped with subject two, and then subject two goes on to become culture positive for the first time in one example within a month and in, in another example within less than a year. So this just gives you an idea of what we're looking at when we look at these timeline overlaps. 
And all these overlaps represent opportunities for transmission. It doesn't convey that there was, in fact, a transmission, but it's epidemiologically linking an opportunity for transmission. This, again, is like a large overview of kind of what each of these centers look like when we look at their, you know, opportunities for transmission. I just want to highlight center two just because of its uniqueness. Here they have this M chimera cluster, which is large, consisting of nine subjects, and they have lots of overlaps. You can see that pretty easily here. They have both clinic overlaps and hospitalization overlaps among all subjects within the cluster. Compared to this M avium cluster, where there's just a single one-time uh, clinic overlap. And the point of this slide is just to show you there's a lot of differences in how these centers present with their opportunities uh, for healthcare-associated overlaps. Next, we look at investigation of common environmental acquisition. And so this is highlighting our healthcare environmental sampling results. And what you see here across the top is the number of swabs that were collected from each individual center. And generally speaking, it was around 150 for all the centers, except for center three, had really robust sampling of almost 300 samples. And again, this was of dust and water biofilms in the healthcare setting. This uh, line highlights the uh, re NTM recovery rate from the swabs that were collected. So the red percentages there show, for example, Center 1 had 6.8% NTM recovery from those environmental samples, whereas Center 3 had a 21% recovery rate. This highlights the number of NTM species identified within each center. And then I'm just going to walk you through the results that are, are shown through the pie graphs here. So in center one, we recovered Mycobacterium avium, and we compared that environmental avium to respiratory isolates that were collected, and we found no similarity between the environmental isolate and any of the NTM respiratory isolates, either from clustered patients or non-clustered patients. In center two, we found um, Mycobacterium chimera, which again, that was the center where we had this large um, cluster of nine patients. And when we compared there, we did find genetic similarity between the environmental isolate and the respiratory M chimera from eight of nine of those subjects. In fact, those eight subjects um, were more closely related to the environmental isolate than they were to each other. If we move to center three, there was no similarity found between any of the environmental isolates collected or the respiratory isolates in that center. And then in center four, we recovered M obsessus from the environment. And there's possible similarity between that M. obsessus and a single patient uh, respiratory isolate. Uh, that patient was not within a cluster, so that would just be a, you know, a one patient acquisition potentially. Um, that investigation is actively underway, so further investigation is in progress. So you already saw the top half of this uh, slide here, so we're going to focus on the investigational outcomes now. So just kind of highlighting, we looked at how many, over, how many clusters had overlapping encounters in the healthcare environment, and you can see the majority of clusters had opportunities for transmission identified. When we look at the number of clustered subjects living in the same watershed, this is data I did not show you uh, graphically, but I just want to highlight that of the four centers, there was only one cluster that happened to be an M. obsessus cluster consisting of three subjects where all subjects lived in the same home of residence watershed, and they had no identified overlaps within the healthcare system. Um, so this was a proxy to, to you know, s suppose that uh, if there's no identified overlaps in the healthcare system, is there a common acquisition outside of the healthcare system? And possibly, yes, their home of residence water um, all came from the same location. If we look at the number of clinically relevant NTM that were recovered in the healthcare environment, you can see that all centers had um, two or more clinically relevant NTMs recovered. We already reviewed that environmental versus respiratory isolate comparison. And so looking at the conclusions of was there evidence of healthcare associated transmission or acquisition, we'll just go through each one. So in the Colorado program, we found evidence of rare M. obsessus transmission and likely M. avium transmission. And again, transmission we are, we're saying is more patient-to-patient -patient transmission. In center two, we didn't find any evidence of transmission, but we did find likely M. chimera acquisition from the healthcare environment among eight of nine clustered patients. And in center three, we didn't find any evidence of transmission or acquisition. That was very likely. And finally, in center four, there was unlikely transmission, but there was maybe one patient that acquired uh, M. obsessus from the healthcare environment. So in summary, the HALT-NTM study 
provides a framework to really standardize how we go about these epidemiologic investigations for potential healthcare associated NTM acquisition and or transmission among people with CF. It's helping us improve the understanding of the frequency and nature of healthcare associated NTM transmission among people with CF. And it's providing potential to identify where acquisition might be at higher probability. And that information can potentially better inform infection prevention and control guidelines that we have. Each center investigation is unique. And we did find evidence of both healthcare associated transmission and um, acquisition within care centers. And with that, there's a long list of people I would like to thank, um, largely from National Jewish. I also would uh, want to comment, Eddie Lipner performs our watershed analysis. So she was at National Jewish and she's now with the NIH. Um, yeah, thank you to the patients who are still giving us samples and to all the participating sites. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions from the audience? And feel free to even stand up and ask the question. I think it's a small enough room that we should be able to hear everyone. Pets? So the question is, did you sample <laughs> pets? <laughs> right. I've not had that question before. Um, no, we did not. Um, th that loosely applies to did we sample the home environment. We, we, did not, we did not sample the home environment just due to the limitations of the funding for the study. Um, it is an interesting question you ask about pets because there, you know, there has been you know, decisions within hospitals to not allow you know, visiting dogs anymore because they carry infections and things like that. So it's a, it's a great question, actually. And no, we have not looked at that. There are labs, though, that are looking at um, NTM within you know, animal populations, but I think that's typically more wild animal populations, not, not so much pets. So it's a good question. I have a quick question. How, how broadly do you find what, define watershed? What constitutes a watershed for a household? <laughs> That's also a really good question. So watersheds actually have multiple levels. Um, so Eddie Lipner is kind of the expert in this um, field. Uh, and so we've picked a specific uh, watershed boundary based on um, USGS reports. Um, and so it encompasses you know, it varies on what it encompasses, actually, depending on what state you're looking at and what location. But typically, it's larger than a city, but smaller, you know, certainly smaller than, like, a state, um, depending on what st state you live in. Again, maybe, like, county level, um, you know, size areas we're talking about. So watersheds really are, you know, where does your water come from, and it, is it a common source? And so that's what we were trying to use as a proxy to say common exposures. Yeah, I, I guess I was surprised by the... The few, the relatively few number of people who lived in the same watershed that, that had. Yes, yeah. yeah. So we've looked at a lot of clusters, as you saw, and, and literally only one across the board fell within the same watershed. Thank you so much, Jane. I was curious about um, if you're planning to enroll further centers or follow these same individuals for a longer period, or what? Can you speak to the next steps a little bit? Sure, that's a great question. Um, uh, yeah, so we ju I just found out actually this week that I got funding from the foundation <laughs> to do a prospective study, um, basically enrolling the same centers that we have now. Um, and so we'll look at, in a more prospective way uh, moving forward. So these were all samples, like I said, that were collected kind of over time, voluntarily submitted samples. Uh, moving forward, we're going to do over a two-year period, you know, everyone who's NTM positive within all these centers will be collected and sequenced and more real-time evaluation as well. So if there is evidence of a cluster, we can respond to that more quickly um, than we were able to in this study, which was very retrospective in nature. Well, congratulations, and I promise we didn't <laughs> rehearse that as a lead into our award. I was like, wow. <laughs> um, I guess there's one more question. Um, I'm curious if you can just speak to the logistical challenges, both you know, collecting samples during the pandemic uh, as well as as we move to more telehealth strategies where people just aren't having as many clinical encounters per se. Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, I think we all are fully aware that between the pandemic and the introduction of um, ETI that respiratory samples have decreased overall. 
And obviously for NTM, you really need a sputum sample or a bronchoscopy sample. Throat swabs don't, don't count. So, um, so we are very focused on that and working with the centers in trying to figure out how to optimize sample collection. So all the centers that we're working with are actually either have moved to or are transitioning to options for either mail-in or drop-off sputum collection, which I think is going to help so that you know, that on-demand in-clinic collection is becoming harder to obtain, but then there are, are people who definitely, with exercise or with illness, are able to produce, and if given the opportunity, they will give that to us. So, um, so we're really working to optimize those mechanisms to collect um, as, you know, as many samples as we can. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? We still have a few minutes. Yeah, that's a great question, too. Um, you know, it's interesting. So the center that had the um, identification of the mycobacterium chimera, which was likely environmentally acquired, they, because of COVID, actually lost their, their historic CF um, inpatient floor. And that's where the, the chimera was found, was in, on the inpatient side of things. Um, but, and so due to the, the pressures of COVID, that was the floor that was used to be the CF floor was turned into a COVID floor. And they've not since gone back to it. Um, so there was, an, you know, an environmental change that was unanticipated, and you know, we discovered this kind of after that change was made. And they've not had any further um, M. obsessus, any other patients fall into that M. obsessus. Or, sorry, I'm saying M. obsessus, that M. chimera cluster. Um, so it seemed to abate that outbreak, um, but it was pandemic imposed uh, and just kind of fortuitous. But so no, they didn't change any practices, but they are looking at their practices and. I think many centers are now kind of doing the same thing, looking at you know where do patients go and how, how are they interacting with the environment and yeah, what cleaning processes are in place, things like that. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you again. So next we'll invite Samantha Durfee to the stage. Hello everyone, thank you all for attending today. My name is Sam Durfee, I'm a PhD student in Pradeep Singh's lab at the University of Washington. And today I have the opportunity to tell you about a project I've been working on, thank you, where we're studying regional Pseudomonas aeruginosa lung infections after treatment with Aluxacaftor, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. Um, and I have no disclosures. There we go. Okay. So, as many in the audience may have seen, um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections generally persist after CFTR is corrected. And a key question that I'm interested in understanding is why that is. And I think as an assumption in the field is that persistent infection may be due to um, structural lung damage. And so what I mean by that is here's an example of a lung from a person with CF where you have areas of the lung with high degrees of damage and other areas with low degrees of damage. And so we thought that these high damage areas may be the source of persistent infection because they could have impaired mucus clearance, dampened immune responses, and higher bacterial density. Additionally, when we look at um, non-CF bronchiectasis, in that case, lung damage can lead to infection and removing the damaged lung regions can cure infection which establishes this link between damage and infection irrespective of CFTR status. We envision two ways that lung damage could lead to chronic infection after CFTR is corrected. In this first model, we thought that perhaps infection is restricted to the damaged regions. And so what I mean here is that before ETI, the patient has pseudomonas throughout their lung regions, and then after they start their CFTR correctors, this 
this model would predict that infection is restricted to the high damage regions and is cleared from the low damage regions. However, we also envision a second way in which damage could lead to infection. And so in this case, it may be that the damaged regions are acting as a reservoir of infection and reseeding undamaged regions after CFTR is corrected. And so in this case, the prediction would be that there's this period of clearance followed by reinfection from the high damage regions into the low damage regions. And distinguishing between these models has important implications for how we treat persistent infection. If the first model occurs, then you can begin to envision regional therapies, like regional targeted therapies. However, if the second um, model occurs, then it's less clear that these regional therapies would be effective. And so to test whether lung damage leads to persistent infection, um, we designed a study that incorporates both models. In this study, we sampled the highest and lowest damage lung regions before and after subjects started ETI. We used CT scans to pick each subject's two highest and then three lowest damaged lung segments and sampled these five regions using bronchoscopy and regional lung washing. And then we also used a new disposable bronchoscope for each region to try and limit cross-contamination between the different regions. And we repeated bronchoscopy a year and a half after the subject started ETI. And finally, we were able to study nine adults with chronic pseudomonas lung infections. I want to begin today by showing you how damage, infection, and inflammation were all linked before patients started ETI. And so to be clear, this data is coming from before the patients started their ETI. And what I've done here is I've split the regions into whether they were the highest damage or lowest damage regions, and each subject has two high and three low damage regions. And what we found, and then, sorry, along the y-axis here, we have Pseudomonas aeruginosa expressed as CFUs per mil of lung wash. And what we found was that in high damage regions, there's about a 20-fold higher concentration of Pseudomonas. Now, we were also interested in inflammation, and we're using neutrophil elastase as our marker of inflammation in this case. And what we found here was that there's about a six-fold higher concentration of neutrophil elastase in the high damage regions as compared to the low damage regions. Okay, so now to test our first model, which it predicts that in people who remain infected after CFTR is corrected, that the infection may be restricted to the high damage lung regions. The way I'll be showing you this along the y-axis is the percent of regions that became pseudomonas negative after treatment with ETI. And first, I'm showing you all of the regions across all of the subjects. And we found that about 40% of the regions cleared their pseudomonas after treatment. However, then when we split it out by the highest and lowest damaged lung regions, we found no difference in the clearance rate between these two groups. Now, I want to talk a little bit more about how these um, cleared regions were distributed across patients because we found a really interesting phenomenon. So in three of the nine subjects, they had undetectable pseudomonas in all five of the regions, which would suggest eradication of the entire infection. And then when we examined the rest of the subjects, nearly all of those regions remained pseudomonas positive. And so we found this pattern where patients either cleared pseudomonas from all of their regions or none of their regions. Now finally, or clearance is not the only metric of how pseudomonas could be responding to ETI. Here along the y-axis, I'm showing the change in pseudomonas expressed as log 10 CFUs, um, and these are in the persistently infected regions. And so when we look at these persistently infected regions, we see that overall there's about a 10-fold decrease in pseudomonas concentration. And then when we break it out by the highest and lowest damage regions, again, we see no difference between these two groups. And so to summarize what I've shown you thus far, ETI produced similar decreases in pseudomonas density in both the highest and lowest damage lung regions, despite the highest damage regions having about 20-fold higher starting CFU, or starting pseudomonas density. And then in the people who remained infected, both the highest and lowest damaged regions remained infected. And so this refuted our hypothesis um, and suggested that infection will not be restricted to the severely damaged regions. 
Now, on to test model two, which suggests that damaged regions are the reservoirs in infection and can then reseed the undamaged regions. Testing this hypothesis will be possible if we have two things. First, if the regional Pseudomonas populations are genetically distinct, by which I mean the Pseudomonas in the highest damage regions are genetically different than the Pseudomonas in the lowest damage regions. Now we know that most patients are infected with a single strain of Pseudomonas, and so I don't mean different strains here. What I'm referring to is the evolution of different genetic characteristics within the different lung regions. The second thing we need in order to test this hypothesis is a method to infer the ancestral location of the post-ETI populations. So in other words, we need to be able to figure out whether these bacteria um, originated in the lowest damage region or the highest damage region. And I'm going to walk you through how we perform these analyses. So we begin by um, performing whole genome sequencing of about 100 Pseudomonas isolates per region. And then we use those isolates to build a phylogenetic tree. On the tree I'm about to show you, each isolate is going to be color coded by the region from which it was sampled. And the, this diagram um, recapitulates the, uh, the anatomic locations of the sampling. And so here we have the phylogenetic tree showing the genetic relationships between all of the isolates in this one patient um, collected before ETI. And so what we see is that isolates that cluster together on the tree are more closely related to each other. And so because we're seeing clustering by location as indicated by the color of the isolate, that indicates to us that we do indeed have these regionally distinct populations. And so the populations in the yellow region are more similar to each other than they are to the isolates in the red region, for instance. And for the sake of time, I'm only showing data from this one subject, but we've gone ahead and repeated it for the remaining five subjects and found similar patterns. Now, the second thing I need in order to test my hypothesis is a method to infer the, which region the post-ETI isolates are descended from. And so, as I showed, and I'm, I'm going to walk through how we do this analysis using hypothetical data. We begin by building a phylogenetic tree of the pre-ETI isolates, as I showed on the last slide. And here, I'm color coding the isolates red for the highest and yellow for the lowest damage regions. And for this example, I've made them perfectly regionally distinct. Then I sequenced the post-ETI pseudomonas that were collected a year and a half later, and they were collected from the same lung regions as the pre-ETI populations. We then add those sequences to the phylogenetic tree and determine the patterns of descent. So for instance, these three isolates were found in the high damage region and descend from the high damage region, which is evidence of local persistence. Then, over here, we have these two isolates that were found in the low damage region and also descend from the low damage region, which is, again, evidence of local persistence. And what we'll be most interested oops, in seeing is an example like this isolate where it was found in the low damage region, but it actually descends from the high damage region. And so this represents a potential migration from the high damage region into the low damage region. And now, for this example, I'm only showing you 12 isolates, but for many patients, we had upwards of 1,000 isolates that we're summarizing across. And so to, to summarize that for you, I chose to use pie charts that represent the proportion of isolates that descend from each region. So what this pie chart means is that two-thirds of the isolates in this region descend from the lowest damage region, and one-third descend from the highest damage region. I'll be walking you through two examples just to demonstrate kind of the heterogeneity that we could see between patients before I summarize across all of the subjects. To begin, we have our pre-ETI key where each region is color coded a unique color. And then these two regions are our highest damage regions in this patient, and these three are the lowest damage regions. Um, and in some cases, I was unable to identify the location of origin, and that will be colored gray. What we saw in the first region was that all of these isolates descended from the orange region, which in this case indicates local persistence within that region. 
Then when we looked at the next region, we found that all of these isolates also descend from the orange region, which represents migration from the orange region into the red region. Finally, when we looked across the rest of the regions, we found that all of the isolates actually descend from the orange region, indicating migration throughout the entire lung. Now, to contrast that, um, we have the second patient where, again, we have each region individually color-coded, with these two regions being the highest damage regions and these three being the lowest damage regions. In this case, so here we have the first region where most of the isolates descend from the orange region, representing local persistence. Then in this region, most of the isolates descend from the red region, again, representing local persistence. And in this third region, we again found a predominance of local persistence. However, in this patient, we also found regions that were mixed. And so in this particular region, about a third of the isolates were the result of local persistence as indicated by this blue section. And then about a third of the isolates were the descendants of the red region, indicating migration into that region. And then finally, in this last region, we see that over half of the isolates descend from another region, indicating migration into that region. And so while this patient it does have mixed patterns, they, their populations were mostly the result of local persistence. So now that I've shown you these two examples, I want to summarize across the rest of the patients. Um, and for this, we have six subjects. Here I will be comparing the um, highest damage regions to the lowest damage regions. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I've simplified it into just local persistence versus migration from any other region. What we found in the highest damage regions was that about 70% of the time, the populations were the result of local persistence within that same region. However, if we compare that to the lowest damage regions, we see that the lowest damage regions only were the result of local persistence about 35% of the time, while they were the result of migration from any other lung region about 65% of the time. Okay, sorry. So what we found was that most subjects were in, remained infected with Pseudomonas after starting ETI, and that after ETI, both the high and low damage lung regions were Pseudomonas positive and exhibited similar decreases in Pseudomonas density. Finally, the preliminary phylogenetic analysis of subjects post-ETI populations revealed that the high damage regions were often the result of local persistence and low damage populations were often the result of migration. Um, and sorry, I know I'm out of time, but can I just finish? Sure, okay. Um, so local, because I, I, I think this is the important part where we talk about like what the implications of these findings are. And so, we think that the local persistence of pre-ETI populations in the high damage regions suggests one of two things. Either or it could be that host conditions may remain permissive to Pseudomonas in those lung regions and or that those local Pseudomonas populations developed adaptations to resist ETI improved host defenses. And then the bacterial migration into the low damage regions suggests that ETI improves the host conditions enough to clear the local populations, but not enough to prevent reinfection by other populations. Or, and it could also mean that the Pseudomonas populations that were replaced were actually less fit in the ETI corrected lung. And so understanding what makes the low damage populations more sensitive and the high damage regions, or high, high damage populations more resistant um, could suggest new therapeutic targets in the future. Um, and so I'll just leave all the acknowledgments up here since I am out of time. But this is like a huge undertaking, so thank you. Thank you so much, Sam. And when you're on the stage, you're the boss, so it's fine. <laughs> um, so there's a number of questions here. So we'll oh, start awesome. with the first one. And I might just split it into two parts. Okay. Um, thank you. So the first part is, do you have the genetics of the patients that cleared infection versus those who did not clear? And was there a difference? Yeah, there was not a difference. Um, seven out of the nine total subjects were Delta F508, and it, there was not like a pattern where the 
two who were not homozygous delta F508 cleared. So and small just, study. But. And just as the second part to that, was there a difference in in the cohort um, to uh, Trikafta for those who cleared versus those who did not? Um, like a response, I assume response to Trikafta. Yes. Yeah. Um, so there, I mean, there is definitely patient to patient heterogeneity, but it did not correlate with infection eradication. Uh, okay, so the next question that we have here is, um, was uh, subject one treated with antibiotics during the study time, and was the yellow strain uh, Pseudomonas uh, multidrug resistant? Oh, that's a really excellent question. Um, we're just finishing up the phenotyping of all of the isolates, and so I will be able to address that in the future, but I cannot address that right now. Um, and then, yeah, sorry, I forgot to check on the antibiotic thing before I came, so I can, we have the data, I just don't know it off the top of my head, so sorry. It also means that you can never change the color code because you'll have to memorize the susceptibility of each color. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so the next question is, have you separated out in cases of migration, is it generally going from high versus low damage regions? Uh, yeah, so um, let's see here. I will first caveat on the reason I didn't show you the precise um, origins is that it is a little bit it's just good to do it multiple ways, and I've only used one algorithm thus far, so I, I can tell you, but just know we're trying, we're going to be replicating it to look for consistency. And so what we found was that there were actually three potential sources of migration. Um, so about a third of the time it was the high damage region, about a third of the time it was a mix between regions, so the lineage that you know, migrated was actually present in two different regions beforehand. Um, and then in the other case, it was a lineage that was never observed pre-ETI, and so it presumably came from one of the unsampled lung regions in that patient. All right, so the next question is, uh, were there other co-traveling microbes? So, were there, was there staff for other uh, uh, gram negatives, for instance? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I wish I could answer that question. We only, we, we've only done the whole genome sequencing for the Pseudomonas thus far, and then we definitely only collected single isolates for Pseudomonas, um, so I can't, I unfortunately cannot answer that for the other microbes, but I think that's potentially a future direction. Okay, um, so the next question here is, uh, do you have data on migration or persistence in people that have not been treated with modulators, so as a, a, an entirely a control group? Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. We don't understand how much of that migration is due to ETI itself. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do in this patient cohort themselves is you can combine the phylogenetics with um, time periods and actually infer how long each lineage um, existed in a particular region. And so then you can compare the inferred length of time in that region in the before ETI era to the, um, like the actual sampled migration rate. So. Okay, yeah, we have a couple more here. One is, um, why, why are you confident that it's migration versus convergent, convergent evolution of the bugs? Yes, excellent question. So um, with the, the advantage of whole genome sequencing is that we get all of the genetic variants, including those in intergenic regions and those that are um, synonymous. And so you can use those neutral, um, either intergenic or synonymous mutations to track the actual, like, the actual lineages as opposed to seeing this like convergent evolution if you were just looking at um, genes that tend to be selected for like class R. Um, one more question here. So I'm just going to summarize this. Uh, okay. So when bronchoscopy and BAL is done to yeah. obtain samples, what was done to you know maintain consistency or standardization of how you obtain samples? Uh, potentially okay. for issues of dilution or other oh, specimen yes. excellent, collection. Excellent question. Um, so we used the same amount of volume to sample each lung region, um, and then we recorded the amount of returned volume, and so we know that there is at most a two-fold variation in the return of the volume. And then to, in addition to using the new 
bronchoscopes for each individual region. We also performed the wedged bronchoscopy where you insert the um, scope far enough into the lung to create a seal and so you don't get any backflow of the fluid into the rest of the regions. Okay, and I'm going to combine two questions. Okay. Uh, uh, one is that is there evidence of uh, er pseudomonas eradication from the BAL samples? And can you comment on if there's evidence of new acquisition of pseudomonas over the interval? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see here. So all of the patients who remained infected remained infected with their same initial starting strain. And so it didn't appear that there was any acquisition of pseudomonas. Um, I will say, so it was only nine people and we definitely selected them to all have pseudomonas ahead of time. So we can't um, assess the rate of like a naive pseudomonas, like a person naive to pseudomonas potentially gaining pseudomonas. But yeah, otherwise, in, there were three subjects of those nine who eradicated, who appeared to eradicate pseudomonas based on the bronchoscopy. Was that it? That is, that's, it. that's it. Okay, brilliant. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you for all the questions. Okay, hey, next we have uh, Dr. Claire Houston, who comes to us from Belfast. Hi, so my name is Claire. I am a postdoc from Queen's University, Belfast. And today I will be presenting some data for you on um, evaluating the total bacterial load and inflammation during IV-treated exacerbations in infrequent and frequent exacerbators. Firstly, I have nothing to disclose. So cystic fibrosis pulmonary exacerbations are a significant source of morbidity for people with CF and are associated with accelerated um, lung function decline, reduced quality of life and survival. Response to current treatment of exacerbations is suboptimal with at least a quarter of people with CF failing to recover to 90% of their baseline FEV1 within three months following treatment. And there is considerable variability in the frequency of exacerbations experienced by people with CF. Uh, data from um, a study of the CF Foundation Patient Registry has shown that the number of prior year exacerbations is an independent risk factor for future IV treated exacerbations. And this graph taken from the study shows that uh, as a patient's number of prior year exacerbations increases their time until next exacerbation decreases. And this highlights that there is an unmet need to improve the prediction, management and treatment of exacerbations. Now improvements to treatment have been limited by our very poor understanding of exacerbation pathophysiology. Um, and there really is known to be a, a dynamic between the um, microbial infection and the host response during an exacerbation. Um, and really what we know about the microbial changes um, underlying exacerbations is very poor. And there has been limited evidence to support the view that an exacerbation is triggered by the overgrowth of a chronic infecting CF pathogen. And 16S amplicon se sequencing studies have um, showed evidence that the communities within the airway during an exacerbation and during stability are relatively similar with um, a high level of resilience and any changes occurring in response to exacerbation tra treatment being transient. Some studies have also shown um, an association between anaerobes and exacerbations and there has been increased focus on understanding the functional changes within the airway microbial community in terms of virulence and metabolism and how these changes may actually be underlying drivers of exacerbations. And of course, viruses are known triggers of exacerbations. So during an exacerbation, there is a heightened inflammatory response within the airway um, seen by increases in neutrophil counts, pro-inflammatory cytokines and proteases within the airway. However, uh, the search for a um, uh, sputum inflammatory biomarker of treatment response hasn't been successful so far. And this is in part due to the substantial heterogeneity in the inflammatory response to treatment. 
And some studies have also shown that there is altered immune cell transcriptional profiles during an exacerbation. And these studies have also shown a degree of heterogeneity in immune cell responses to treatment. And of course, it's important to recognize that poor adherence to chronic medication is a key contributor to these events. So the pathophysiology of exacerbations is clearly very complex and responses to treatment are heterogeneous. An improved understanding of this is needed in order to improve treatment of these events. Uh, we carried out the airspace study with the aim of comparing clinical, immune and microbiological responses to IV treated exacerbations between people with CF that have a history of infrequent exacerbations and those that have a history of frequent exacerbations to see if um, these patient groups represent two different exacerbation phenotypes. This was a small single centre observational study carried out at the Northern Ireland Adult Regional CF Centre in the Belfast City Hospital between the years of 2019 and 20. So just prior to the COVID-19 pandemic and prior to the introduction of um, highly effective modulator therapy as well. We recruited adults with CF who had an exacerbation and the definition of exacerbation we used was hospital admission for initiation of new IV antibiotic treatment. And we recruited patients at the time of admission uh, once recruited patients were assigned into one of two defined groups based on their medical history in the previous 12 months. Firstly, frequent exacerbators, those patients who had experienced at least two or more exacerbations requiring treatment with IVs, or infrequent exacerbators, those who had experienced no or one exacerbation requiring treatment with IVs. And we recruited a total of 15 frequent and 14 infrequent exacerbators. Uh, we measured various clinical parameters during admission, including lung function and serum inflammatory markers, as well as 24 hour sputum volume and collected expectorated sputum and serum samples at three different study visits during hospitalization. Firstly, within 24 hours of treatment, initiation on day zero. Secondly, between day three and five of treatment. And thirdly, at the end of treatment. This slide summarizes the baseline demographics and clinical characteristics of our study cohorts. We actually didn't find any significant differences in any of these variables between cohorts, including age, CF genotype, and chronic pseudomonas infection status. Um, however, the frequent exacerbator cohort did have a lower mean uh, percent predicted FEV1, but this was not statistically significant, and perhaps we didn't capture this difference as much due to our small numbers in the study. Um, but there were a small number of patients in each group who were on single or dual um, modulator therapy as well. So firstly, I'll present some data on the clinical responses to treatment in both cohorts. Uh, we find that uh, in, infrequent, in the infrequent cohort, they had a significant improvement in uh, percent predicted FEV1 by the end of treatment whereas uh, the frequent exacerbator cohort had no significant change in FEV1 by the end of treatment. Frequent exacerbators had a higher 24-hour uh, sputum volume on day zero and day five of treatment and had a higher serum CRP at day five of treatment. And um, we, we looked at the within-group changes and found that infrequent exacerbators had significant early uh, improvement uh, decline in CRP between day zero and day five, whereas frequent exacerbators had a significant later decline in CRP between day five and end of treatment. Also, frequent exacerbators had a higher neutrophil count at the start of treatment in serum. Next, we um, looked at sputum total bacterial and pseudomonas load by qPCR, and we found that frequent exacerbators had a higher total bacterial load on day five and at the end of treatment with infrequent exacerbators having a significant early decline in their total bacterial load between day zero and day five, whereas frequent exacerbators had no overall change in their total bacterial load. There was no difference in total pseudomonas load between cohorts 
indicating that these uh, differences in total bacterial load were not attributable to Pseudomonas. Also, we measured IL-8 in sputum and found that frequent exacerbators had a higher IL-8 level at the end of treatment and a higher IL-1-beta level on day five and at the end of treatment, with only infrequent exacerbators having a significant decline in both of these markers in response to treatment. Uh, both sputum IL-8 and IL-1-beta uh, significantly positively correlated with total bacterial load in sputum. Um, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the host response during an exacerbation to see if this would shed a little bit of light on the different clinical inflammatory and bacterial responses that we have seen between cohorts. And so we analysed uh, sputum collected on day zero and day five by untargeted proteomics. And we found that um, infrequent exacerbators and uh, frequent exacerbators had um, significantly different protein expression with 23 proteins significantly differentially expressed between cohorts on day zero and 34 proteins significantly differentially expressed um, on day five. And the majority of these proteins had a higher abundance in infrequent exacerbators. These heat maps show the expression profile of the significantly differentially enriched proteins, and they importantly reveal that there is strong clustering of most samples from within each study group. So the frequent exacerbator samples highlighted by the pink squares at the top and the purple squares on the day five heat map um, do cluster together mostly on the right-hand side of the heat map. And the heat map also showed that there was strong clustering based on lung function severity with patients with moderate or severe uh, present predicted FEV1 shown by the darker um, blue squares at the top here, also clustering together with the frequent exacerbator samples mostly on the right-hand side of the heat map. Proteins that were higher in infrequent exacerbators were mostly secreted proteins, many of which had innate host defense functions and included a range of antimicrobials, antiproteases, and immunomodulatory proteins. Whereas proteins higher in frequent exacerbators were mostly intracellular proteins, many of which were found within um, the published net proteome and some pro-inflammatory mediators as well. We validated our proteomics results by selecting a number of proteins of interest for analysis by Western Blot and ELISA, and some of this validation data is shown here for the proteins lipochelin one Cystatin-SA, and Splunk-1, which the Western Blot data confirmed that were higher in infrequent exacerbator samples. For the last uh, couple of minutes of my talk, I just want to focus my attention on SLIPI. So SLIPI was a protein revealed to be significantly higher in infrequent exacerbators by proteomics. It's a multifunctional host defense protein secreted into the airway by the epithelium and immune cells. And it's the major elastase inhibitor of the upper respiratory tract. It has broad spectrum antimicrobial activity and also has anti-inflammatory properties as well. We validated slippy levels in sputum by ELISA and really interestingly found significantly lower slippy levels at all time points throughout treatment in the frequent exacerbator cohort. Um, and then this prompted us to look at slippy in, in our, our serum samples. And we didn't find a difference in slippy levels in, in serum between cohorts, indicating to us that this reduced slippy was compartmentalized within the airway in frequent exacerbators. And this um, prompted us to investigate what mechanisms could be leading to this. Slippy is known to be susceptible to proteolytic degradation by neutrophil elastase in the Pseudomonas aeruginosa infected lung. We carried out an experiment with pulled sputum from infrequent and frequent exacerbators, and we found that recombinant slippy um, was selectively cleaved by frequent exacerbator sputum after a 24 hour period. Uh, whereas it remained full length and intact in the frequent, or sorry, in the infrequent exacerbator sputum. Using a range of broad spectrum and specific protease inhibitors, we were able to determine that neutrophil elastase 
was the protease responsible for cleaving slippy within the sputum, indicating that there was an excess of elastase activity within the frequent exacerbator sputum samples. Um, however, when we then went to measure neutrophil elastase activity within all of our individual samples, we didn't find a significant difference between cohorts. And we then looked at how elastase activity correlated with slippy concentration. And we um, indeed found that there was a significant negative correlation between elastase activity and slippy concentration, with the, this correlation being even stronger within the frequent exacerbator samples shown in blue here. And this prompted us to look at the data a slightly different way. We compared elastase activity between slippy turtiles and found that the turtile with the lowest slippy levels had the highest elastase activity across all time points during treatment. And interestingly, all of the samples within um, this slippy turtile were from, sorry, all samples within the low slippy turtile were from frequent exacerbators. And this uh, increase in elastase was not simply due to increased numbers of neutrophils in sputum, because we didn't find a difference in neutrophil numbers between infrequent and frequent groups or between slippy turtiles. To conclude my talk, uh, we find evidence of different clinical, microbiological and inflammatory responses to IV treated exacerbations in infrequent and frequent exacerbators. We find evidence that frequent exacerbators have a lower abundance of many innate host defense proteins and a higher abundance of net associated proteins. And um, that the innate host defense is diminished in these patients, which may increase their susceptibility to infection, reduce their bacterial killing capacity, and lead to poor resolution of associated inflammatory responses. We also find that slippy is lower in frequent exacerbators due in part to enhanced elastase mediated degradation of slippy, leading to a greater protease antiprotease imbalance in the airway. And then we suggest that frequent exacerbators therefore may benefit uh, greatly from therapeutics targeting the protease antiprotease imbalance. Um, thank you for listening and I just want to acknowledge my colleagues in the Welcome Wilson Institute for Experimental Medicine and in the School of Pharmacy who helped the study at Queen's, also the CF clinical care team in the Belfast City Hospital and of course the patients who kindly participated in the study. Thank you. Uh, so far the only question in the app is for the wrong workshop, so <laughs> and it's not your theme to ours, so. Unless you want to answer about macrophages. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I do have a question for you. Um, was, is there a, was there a duration of treatment difference between the uh, frequent exacerbators and the infrequent exacerbators? Good question. There was no difference um, in treatment duration. The main treatment duration for both groups was about 11.5 days. It was very similar. That's a really interesting perspective that I hadn't thought, thought about, and I, I don't have any data to say to support that either way, but something we should definitely look into, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So we did measure other the activity of other proteases. We measured cathepsin S and proteinase 3 and didn't find differences between cohorts. Um, in our incubation, in our incubations, we used a variety of protease inhibitors which would have inhibited uh, pseudomonas elastase um, and other classes of proteases and found that only when we inhibited and neutral elastase did we restrict slippy cleavage. 
So this did indicate to us that elastase was the protease responsible, but certainly within the airway, you know, this was in an experimental setting, so there could be other proteases involved, but we didn't find any differences in the ones that we measured. Yeah. Can you speak up? <laughs> uh, no. So we, we only measured a total bacterial load and pseudomonas load by QPCR. We didn't do any other analysis. We were restricted due, due to sample volume. Um, but yeah, that could that would be something very interesting to look at. Um, I have a quick question. I'm curious on if you had follow up samples beyond sort of the yeah. treatment duration to say like when they're back to their so called baseline. Yeah. Um, how does how do these things differ? Yeah. So when we designed the study, we were um, planning on collecting four to six week follow-up samples and we do have some of those for some patients. Unfortunately, COVID hit at a really bad time and we missed um, a lot of the four to six week follow-ups. So um, we don't really, we didn't look at, at those samples very heavily because of that, but we do have some samples and it's something we want to do is to follow up, you know, the levels of some of these proteins to see whether they change um, at that time point, yeah. I have a question now that I know the timing of this uh, study, which is, um, of course, the total frequency of exacerbations has gone down when uh, people are started on Keftrio or ETI. Um, do you did you do you have patients whose phenotype changed after uh, the initiation of that drug, so that they went from frequent to infrequent, frequent to infrequent exacerbators, and could you learn something from that in the future? Yeah, great question. We don't have that data. We we did follow patients up for, you know, through the medical notes for a period. There were a lot of, of gaps in that data due to the pandemic. So um, I'm not sure, but it's something we would be really interested in looking at is going and looking at those patients again and seeing how that changed, certainly, yeah. Any other last questions? I can ask a quick question. Um, did you, and this is something that you may have done, but I'm curious if you have either already done or planning to do anything looking at just gender differences in some of these, like slip, mm -hmm. slippy, et cetera. So that's a great question because we know that, um, that there is a link between females and slippy. We, we don't have any plans to look at that, but it certainly would be something really interesting to pursue further, yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Claire. Thank you. I think it's impossible to walk quietly across the stage. So we didn't want to just have five speakers. We wanted to have six, so we got a bonus. Um, so we'd like to invite uh, Dr. Rebecca Davidson as well as Mylene Saavedra to the stage. Okay, so Rebecca and I are going to co-present um, this presentation. I hope that's okay. <laughs> um, so for the past three years, Rebecca and I and a very talented team um, have worked on designing a targeted sequencing panel that could do several things. That could detect Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus species, that could be able to determine virulence factors and that also could detect antimicrobial resistance profiles from the sputum. 
Now, what we're going to show you is our initial work with this. So this was our pilot study with this panel. And we are going to give you the technical side, which Rebecca is an expert in. But we also wanted to have a clinical lens on how might this information be useful, in particularly in the post-trikafta period. Is it the middle? Or use that one instead. Okay, so um, oh, okay. So there are no disclosures. Um, so we actually started this project before Trikafta was approved, and then after Trikafta was approved, we had to make a pivot once we understood that things were really going to change in terms of sputum microbiology when it came to our patients. And so the first and the most important thing is that many of our patients would produce little to no sputum after the approval of Trikafta. So our ability to identify species and to do it in very small quantities of DNA was going to be very important. The next thing that we needed to do was to take into account that, yes, these patients would still experience pulmonary exacerbations, but that they were going to live longer lifespans, that they would experience more pulmonary exacerbations. And so how do we balance this issue of antimicrobial resistance, a long period of treatment, maximizing efficacy, and minimizing toxicity. And finally, the question of inhaled antibiotics. And so when you have a person who doesn't produce sputum anymore, and you don't know what their infections are, how do you advise them in terms of inhaled antibiotics? And, and so there are infections, and there are infections, right? And so we wanted to see, could we devise a panel that would help us understand more about the biology of that infection in that particular individual? Okay, so real quick, um, we picked Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staph aureus because even though they are declining in the post-trikafta period, they still are the most common bacterial pathogens that we are culturing out of CF patients. And um, a quick uh, note on the registry. So this is data uh, from the CF registry report highlights. And you can see the reduction in Pseudomonas and Staph and all the other pathogens. But it's important to remember that this 2021 data reflects decreased clinic visits, um, decreased sputum production. Uh, and so this may not be an accurate number. And so we really. We'd like to look for molecular tools that will help us understand what, does, what is that true number. So there are kind of these two juxtaposing um, huge challenges <laughs> that come up when you think about infections in CF and also looking at the infections. And the first is this issue of antimicrobial therapy and our traditional approach to antimicrobial therapy has been kind of strong, right? You, you use more than one antibiotic, you use synergistic combinations, you attack the cell wall, you, attra you attack intracellularly. Well, are we going to, I mean, there are toxicities to doing that um, in the short term and in the long term. How are we going to think about that going into the future? And how are we going to devise regimens? And how are we going to make recommendations for people who have these kind of less virulent infections and more virulent infections or more high risk infections? And so that was something that really was important to us in devising this panel. The other challenge is the challenge of antimicrobial resistance. So there are multiple mechanisms of resistance, right? Some are intrinsic, so that means they're encoded in the bacterial chromosome, such as in what you see in efflux pumps. Some are acquired, so they're mobile elements, and, um, and so that would be another one to consider. And then finally, there are adaptive uh, mechanisms of resistance, which have to do with quorum sensing and biofilm formation. Some of them are going to be presence and absence. Some of them are going to show changes in gene expression. So how do you detect? Do you detect using DNA, which is going to be easier uh, from a technical standpoint? Do you detect trying to extract RNA? And so at this point, we went to Dr. Davidson for her help. <laughs> help. <laughs> Well, thanks, Dr. Savedra, for that introduction. Um, so she gave a really good in, um, introduction about the challenges for designing a, 
a targeted sequencing panel. So if I can figure out the slides. So, you know, let's just review how can you sequence bacteria, you sequencing the sequence um, bacteria from a complex sample. So um, we have all very familiar, especially in this community, with 16S rRNA sequencing. And with this approach, it is an amplicon sequencing method. You amplify and sequence um, basically all of the 16S genes that will amplify out of your complex sample. Um, this is relatively simple, which I'll put in quotes, is from the lab and the analysis perspective um, compared to some of the other approaches. Um, but some of the downsides is that you downsides are that because it's an ecological approach, well, first of all, you can sometimes only get to the genus level in many cases. It's really kind of a, an ecological approach, so it's really kind of a um, looking at it from a community perspective rather than really focusing in on species level, strain level, or AMR um, detection. And then really I think even though there's been a lot of great work that we have seen over the years um, at this conference especially, I think there have been some challenges with how do you interpret this data clinically and how would you um, use this um, to um, help make decisions um, for clinical care. So um, there's also metagenomic sequencing. So this one is um, basically you find a way in the lab and the molecular side to either deplete your human or um, enrich for your bacterial DNA and then you just sequence everything in there. So that's really great because you get a lot of stuff, but it also makes the data analysis a lot more complicated. Um, in this case, you can get species level annotation and look for AMR genes, um, but is this really a scalable approach to you know, looking at a lot of samples and it's, um, especially with the data management and analysis challenges. So there really is actually a, a method that kind of blends these two together and I, we're calling it target, targeted amplicon sequencing. And this is um, an approach that we've used here and I'll kind of explain it over here. We're using an approach called AmpliSeq and um, in this case we are doing amplicon sequencing similar to 16S, however we um, design specific primers for our genes of interest that we choose. So there's a lot that goes into the design process. Um, this method can be used with a minimal amount of sputum DNA as low as only five nanograms of starting input. We've tested it all the way down. And um, it's basically just a multiplex PCR. You build a sequencing library and you sequence it. And our, for our analysis metrics and readouts, um, we are going to look at, and Mimi will show some data. I will and she will too show some read counts per species. We will also show you how we can estimate strain ratios. For example, percent of your staff population that is MRSA and then um, also look at the read counts per AMR gene. Um, so for our panel design, we started with an existing um, community panel that's called the PANBAC panel from Thermo Fisher. So this was one that was already existing and had been developed a long time ago, but it wasn't really specific for CF. So we um, selected a subset of genes that we thought were interesting to us, and then we went and added some additional genes to make this customized for CF. So we um, chose um, genes from this uh, database called the Comprehensive Antibiotic Resistance Database, which is um, really a great, um, a great resource if you need to look up AMR genes. And we pretty much just pulled every Pseudomonas and Staph gene. These have been, uh, um, they have been curated by that they have been identified in the literature as either having um, gene expression or a mutation or presence absence that can confer AMR. Um, we also pulled out some uh, Pseudomonas genes that are potentially involved with biofilm formation from this paper in microbial genomics in 2019. And then we added also at the last minute these um, ESX, ESD uh, virulence genes, which in this paper in 2020 were shown that particular mutations could affect disease progression. So for the species detection part of this, we're able to detect um, PA, SA, a few other um, lung microbes and then a handful of um, GI bugs as well. This panel has a total of 221 gene targets and most of them are PA or SA AMR genes. So our hypothesis is that this amplicon sequencing method would detect um, species levels, mixed strain infections, and presence and absence of AMR genes from sputum and with the advantages over culture of improved sensitivity and ability to detect emergent infections and hopefully be clinically relevant in information. So I'm going to go quickly through our testing and optimization, try not to go over. So we have, a, I'm going to show, we're going to show testing the panel on DNA from pure bacterial strains to confirm primer specificity and create standard curves. We also evaluated the panel on a pilot um, set of sputum samples and then compared our amplicon detection results with culture and AST and a little sneak peek of pre versus post ETI samples.
So here's testing the panel on bacterial DNA. We had either pure bacterial DNA, um, and single strains or mixtures of strains, and this is showing the heat map of species level detection. The red color is just the readout is log two read counts, and you can just see the red is higher counts and blue is lower counts. So essentially we're detecting what we expect to detect based on our input. Columns here are the samples, and the rows are the, um, the species read counts. Next, we created a standard curve with pure bacterial DNA. So we basically spiked in um, MRSA DNA into a background of MSSA DNA at different um, percentages. And then we created a MRSA count metric, which um, did a very nice job of um, monitoring the percent MRSA in a population of staff. So here's the gene level detection in the bacterial DNA. So now the rows are the samples and the columns are the genes, still log to read, um, read counts are the readouts. And so what you can see here, we clustered it on the genes and the samples, and you can see that we really have nice separation of the staph genes, the pseudomonas genes, you can see the little cluster of MRSA genes in there. And then the um, genes that don't have any detection are the ones for the other species. So based on this result, we feel like we have very good um, primer specificity and that the primers are detecting the the um, bugs that we hope they are. And so um, then we tested it on a pilot study of sputum samples, and Mimi's going to um, go through these results. OK, I'm back. So, um, so this is now when you go to the patients, right? So we did all the QI work on the bacterial, the pure bacterial DNA. Um, and so now we wanted to say what happens when you try to apply this system to complex cultures as we know our patients have. And so um, you can see here that they, there, were, there were cultures out of those 13 that had only pseudomonas, only staph, and then mixtures of pseudomonas and staph as well. Okay, so now how, when you apply the panel, I'm going to just kind of walk you through this. So these are patients who have only had pseudomonas in their cultures, right? And so if you look here on the rows, these are the log read counts from the panel showing that there are pseudomonas read counts but not staph in those, for those cultures. These now are patients who had pseudomonas and staph in their cultures. And if you look at the rows, you have staph read counts and you have pseudomonas read counts. And then finally, this last group only grew staph in their culture, and you can see that you have staph read counts, but no pseudomonas read counts. Now, I'm sure that you see that there's this unusual pattern down over here, and this is where you can kind of start to use technology like this to understand a little bit more about what's going on in your patient. This particular patient, um, in comparison to all of these other patients, um, had a significant alcohol history. And so he had bacterioides, enterococcus, strep. And so there's this consideration was could he possibly have been experiencing microaspiration um, at the time he was having his exacerbation. Now this is looking at within the patient cultures, the the culture results from the micro lab versus the panel results. Okay, so on the x-axis is the culture results from the micro lab, and you see here that these two were pseudomonas negative, these were pseudomonas positive, and so these are the log read counts from the panel. And so using this in our little tiny sample size of 13, we had perfect sensitivity and specificity um, which made us very happy, and of course, obviously, we have to test this in a much larger cohort. A little bit of a different thing happened when it came to staff. So when we looked at staff recounts, so on the, on the x-axis, these are patients who had negative cultures in the micro lab for staff, and these had positive cultures in the micro lab for staff. Um, and, the, and then these are their staff recounts, and so you can see that we did detect patients who had higher read counts, but then there were two patients above the level of, the dete of detection who came back negative um, in the micro lab, but positive on our assay. And that is where a sputum culture is like a page in a story, right? It's like a page in a book. And so when you look longitudinally at patients' cultures, there's so much flux in patients', patients cultures. And so this top patient actually had a long history of mixed cultures with Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. On that particular day when they gave their sample, 
it only grew Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but then one year later on their cultures were again growing Pseudomonas and Staph aureus. And so in this particular patient, that Staph aureus was missed by culture but identified by DNA sequencing. This patient was a little bit different. So this patient, in the year prior, on the day of, and then a year after, only cultured Pseudomonas and didn't have a culture, a history of culturing staph. And so the question is, this just being above the limit of detection, this is semi-quantitative, and so could it be that they have some low level of staph infection? And if there's a change in clinical status, would that be beneficial to know that there is possibly another pathogen there that's trying to grow? So let's talk about, so we just talked about species. Let's go to strain. I'll go real quick. Um, and so when we talk about strain, um, the most common issue that comes up is MRSA versus MSSA, right? And so on the x-axis here are basically patients who in the micro lab had a positive calorime uh, yeah, calorimetric test for PBP2, meaning that they had MRSA versus patients whose was negative, meaning that they had MSSA, and then this year is our assay uh, for MRSA counts. And now if you remember the standard curve that Rebecca showed, they were able to do a MRSA count metric. And so up here, 100% of the MRSA here from the total staph aureus was MRSA. Over here, from these MSSA patients, 0% was MRSA from the total staph aureus. Here, this particular one, we estimate that was just above the level of detection based on her standard curve was approximately 10% MRSA. So what was going on there? So MRSA, of course, also is on a spectrum. And so when we look at MICs to MS MSSA, which all these patients had, all of these patients had MICs of less than 0.5. This particular patient had an MIC of 1. And then for our clinical lab, basically an MIC of 2 or greater indicates MRSA. And so what you can see is this, this flux, right, of, of a person whose culture kind of has been an intermediate state. And so this is something you wouldn't necessarily be able to detect this kind of issue of, a small amount of MRSA in a total culture that's mostly MSSA. And so that's something that's unique and also may be helpful when you have a patient who has a, a change in clinical status. So those were single genes. What happens when you look at the entire panel? And now we have the genes in rows and the samples are in columns. And I just want to point out three things. So Definitely there was variation when you looked at these 13 patient samples. And so here you can see this particular person had a PA gene deletion and they had knocked out their MEX GHI efflux pump. That potentially would indicate a less virulent pseudomonas. This, per this person here had knocked out their ESXA type 3 secretion system. Also, similar thought. There are staph deletions going on as well. And you can see that down here where you have um, beta-lactamase deletions as well as ERMA, ERMC methylase deletions. Now, how would that apply when it comes to modulators? Well, what happens when you apply a panel like this to patients, bef you know, to the same patient before and after they're treated with the modulator? It's a part of what we're interested of looking at with this panel, and luckily we were able to have three patients where we could actually look at that. And so we have subject A, who in this first column, this is pre-modulator, and the second column is post-modulator. And you can see here there's very little change. <coughs> Subject B actually did have a change, and so here she is pre, here she is post. She had a deleted PSL operon, which plays a role in biofilm formation. And then subject C didn't really have much change in her pseudomonas, but she really had a lot less staph, which she traditionally grew with every exacerbation. And so in relating that to clinical scenarios, uh, on the y-axis here are number of admissions in the two years prior and the two years after starting Trikafta. So in this patient who had very little change in her pseudomonas species and AMR and virulence, she had the exact same number of admissions before and after. 
the patient who lost her PSL operon went down by to a third of her, of her two-year prior admission rate, and then the patient who lost her staph but continued to her, with her pseudomonas had a half. And so these are things that, that may be important in trying to consider a patient's clinical course in the context of what they grow and, and the heterogeneity that you get when you treat people with modulators. Oops. Okay, it's our conclusion slide. So in conclusion, we can do species detection with this panel. We can do strain detection with this panel. We can detect emerging infections and we can do it with very small amounts of DNA. We are now, we have actually just performed this in 70 subjects um, and are going through the data. Um, but we really, we really are, as we go through the data, really trying to figure out what are the best ways that we can use data like this and apply it to understanding how to personalize care for patients who have chronic bacterial infections in the post trichafta period. We have a tremendous team. Uh, honestly, everyone on this team has been so important to the success of this pilot and to the success of the larger project. And, um, and we appreciate the funding from the CF Foundation to do this. Thank you. So we have just a couple of minutes for any questions. All right. So I, the first one here is, can you please comment on the potential context of colonization versus infection, uh, particularly for staff? Yeah, yes. Um, so. I mean, I, th I think that, that the way that you think, so the reason why we aren't doing just species detection alone is that we want to be able to understand a little bit more about the pathogen. And so for that reason, we have, that's why we've put in the issues about strain, the issues about is there, is there some degree of MRSA in there, which definitely has ramifications for patients with CF. Um, are there virulence factors related to staph? And so, um, and how much AMR? So ultimately what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to quantify and say the percent of AMR within the sample is X or Y. And so you're right, ultimately that's something that a clinician would have to take into account, right? So are they, what are they experiencing? Are they having a drop in FEV1? Are they having clinical symptoms? This is, not, this is not there to take over that. It's there to augment it and help the clinician guide them in their decision as to whether to treat or not. Okay, so this is one other question. Um, so are the resistance genes that you evaluated uh, chromosomally encoded or are they plasmid based or other mobile elements that can be gained and lost? And I would, at this point I can say, Dr. Davidson, help. <laughs> Yeah, so the really the answer is all of the above. There's you know every kind of um, of um, of the potential scenarios that Mimi had introduced earlier, and so that's why we really want to also analyze this in um, sputum RNA if we can, because I think you know we're not only going to see presence and absence of genes, which is like the easiest thing to do analysis wise, but we can also look for um, resistance mutations, comparing mutations. That's like maybe second easiest. Probably the hardest thing is um, really trying to associate. Um, differential expression patterns with um, poor clinical outcomes. So um, all of the above is the answer. Sam, this will be, oh, sorry, that's very loud. Last question. Yes. Um, can you differentiate SCVs from like, other staph aureus? Do you think this panel and the panel? <laughs> yeah, so we do have that data, you know, for the, on the culture side, right? So we just need to kind of we're still in the process of associating the Amplicon data with all of these like clinical metrics, right? So but I think one thing that I just want to say really quickly is the idea of like trying to associate microbiologic, you know, outcomes with, you know, um, results from a whole sputum, right? So we're really kind of surveying the whole population, which I think is exciting. Um, but we really have to think about, you know, those associations and what do they mean, so. Well, thank you both. Okay, and to uh, the final talk of the session will be Dr. Gail Stanley, who comes to us from Yale.
Well, thank you everybody for sticking out on a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Gail Stanley, and um, this is my mentor, or John Koff is my mentor, and I work in the lab, um, as well with the collaborators of um, Dr. Chain and Dr. Turner at the Phage Center uh, at Yale. And now that we're, um, and this project is describing some single sequential bacteria phage therapy um, and decreasing, or decreases pseudomonas virulence and cystic fibrosis compared to a cocktail approach. Um, so for my disclosures, I have no financial relationships, um, but SciFi is a clinical trial and it's on um, phage and, and therapy. Uh, it's funded by the Yale University and the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And the Yale University is in process of licensing phage intellectual property to a company. Just a little bit of an outline, so I will briefly review bacteria, phage. Um, I'll introduce the concepts of phage therapy, the targets and design, discuss consequences of phage therapy on pseudomonas, and then compare single phage to cocktail phage therapy designs. So now we are all excellent and experts of AMR as um, compared to my previous or, um, present, or the previous presenter. So thank you very much for this excellent segue. It was really helpful. Um, and so we know that um, pseudomonas is um, one of the most prevalent pathogens and it is the most common pathogen in adults with, with cystic fibrosis and their sputum. It's increasingly multidrug resistant and pandrug resistance um, pseudomonas is being observed. And there's essentially no new antibiotics in the pipeline. So we need to think of some other novel treatments to address this issue. And this may be novel, but it's actually really, really old. So bacteriophages were first discovered in the early 1900s um, and have been around and widely used mainly in Eastern Europe um, with over 300,000 patients that have received bacteriophage therapies for a variety of issues. Um, bacteriophage therapy that we use is inhaled. It's only lytic phage, um, and this is to ensure that there is no lysogenic genes that are inserted um, into the bacteria to create, you know, even worse superbug. Um, and lytic phages, what they do for the life cycle is they insert their genome in there and they replicate inside the bacteria, thereby creating so many virus particles in the bacteria that it lyses the bacteria, and that's how it kills. When it lyses the bacteria, it, it exert or exudes all the viron particles into the surrounding environment, acting as a self-amplifying treatment. So for compassionate use of phage therapy for MDR and PDR pseudomonas infections in cystic fibrosis, what does it look like? So this is one of our patients that was kindly enough um, to volunteer to do a interview with a local newspaper. Um, and, and this is her photograph here of receiving phage therapy in our clinic. Um, so, and phage therapy at Yale is inhaled therapy. It's provided um, over a course of seven to 10 days. It can be done inpatient or outpatient. Yes, we mail these things to our patients. Um, it is stable for a while and, and refrigeration. Um, the targets that we have right now for phage therapy at Yale um, is we have a phage library for Pseudomonas, at Chromobacter, MRSA, and E. coli. And then the Center for Phage Biology and Therapy at Yale has a clinical trial called SciFi. These are the different targets of pseudomonas um, that I'm going to be focusing you on. Um, so initially there was three phages that we were using in our initial cohort of compassionate use cases. Um, the three different targets were the antibiotic efflux pump, OMK01, uh, the type 4 pillus pump, um, and the LPS, um, or sorry, type 4 pillus structure, and the LPS structure. So why did we uh, have these targets and how was it um, thought of? So this is the brilliant Dr. Turner and Dr. Chan as part of the Phage um, Center. And I have been so honored to, in order to work with them. And what they have discovered um, when using phage therapy is they wanted to design therapy that not only was highly effective at killing the bacteria, but what other mechanisms um, is it having an effect on the bacteria that would be benefit to the human host? And so for example, um, you have phage or you have bacteria such as pseudomonas that are highly virulent. So they have antibiotic efflux pumps in there that are pumping out all your antibiotics. They have an overexpression of type 4 pillar structures. They have really, really tall, strong LPS to, to develop those biofilms. And when they're insulted or in, exposed to a high concentration of viruses, a high concentration of phage, they want to be able to survive the phage. And by doing so, they want to decrease the targets of the phage. So remember the targets that we chose for the phages are the antibiotic pumps, are the type 4 pillars, and are the LPS structures. And so we are driving um, 
but, but in order for the phage or for the bacteria to survive, they want to decrease those uh, targets. And so by way, they'll become resistant to the phage. But we want them to be resistant to our phage because that means they have less of those targets. So they'll have less of the antibiotic efflux pump. And this was um, what was published in one of his first papers here. Um, when they have less antibiotic efflux pumps, then of course they are more sensitive to our antibiotics. And so when we look at the initial nine patients in the cohort of this compassionate use cases, um, there were a variety of designs um, that were used. Some patients received a cocktail of phage um, therapy described as um, two or more phages um, provided at the same time in, in, the, in the inhaled treatment. And um, we looked at the, um, we took their cultures before they were treated, and we wanted to make sure that they were sensitive to our phage library. So that's how they were screened in um, to get treatment. And you can see here with the uh, open circles uh, here representing sensitivity um, to the phage. I went the wrong way, I am sorry. And then afterwards, this was um, something that we were expecting and hoping for. Um, when you take samples um, that were measured from their sputum seven to, four, seven to 14 days um, after phage therapy, we are seeing that resistant profile. So the bacteria that's around that remains there, those survivors, they're resistant to our phage. But also that means that there's a clinical benefit outfit, outcome to it. So this work um, that I want to um, talk about more was they already did a lot of work. Dr. Turner and Dr. Chan did a lot of work on the OMK-01 efflux pump. And I am moving forward now with the LPS and the type 4 pump, or the type 4 pillus structures. And so type 4 pillus structures, I'll remind you, is involved in surface attachment for pseudomonas, twitching motility, pyocyanin production. Um, pyocyanin is an endotoxin or exotoxin that pseudomonas produces, which is highly inflammatory to human lungs and structures. Um, and it's also type 4 pillus is involved in biofilm production. And so first we want to uh, ensure you that um, targeting the type 4 pillus is still really highly effective at killing the bacteria. Um, so for the patients that received type 4 pillus um, treatment, there is seven out of the nine patients uh, received some form of the type 4 pillus phage therapy. Uh, and you can see that there is a decrease in the pseudomonas CFUs by a four log reduction after therapy. Uh, we also observed um, an improvement in their lung function measured by present predicted FFV1 with a mean of 6%. And um, what I have previously presented um, were some of the secondary effects of this or consequences of this on the pseudomonas. And what we uh, was really um, neat to observe is pyocyanin is not only a toxin, but is responsible for that green-blue color of pseudomonas. So you can look at the sputum, you can look at their cultures, and you can ac actually track them and trend them and see visually that they're, be that they're decreasing their pyocyanin production, um, which is really awesome. So these are uh, super natants from bacterial cultures. And so before, you can guess, are the green one, and then after treatment is the yellow one. And, and then you can measure the, pseudo or the pyocyanin um, in these samples, and you can see a, re a reduced amount. When you look at markers of inflammation after phage therapy, so a little bit of, um, I want to back you up just a little bit on the pyocyanin, and when I did my further experiments on the pseudomonas and, and how is it going to affect the, the human host, uh, I wanted to make sure that when I was looking at differences in bacterial variants and, and what the outcomes were, that it wasn't the differences that I'm seeing is not just because I'm killing all the bacteria, and of course there's going to be less pyocyanin, right? I want to ensure that I'm actually getting this effect on the pseudomonas. I'm changing its virulence. So when I take the samples of the, of the sputum samples from our patients before and after therapy, I isolate the pseudomonas and I grow those cultures to the same um, amount. And so I normalize those culture things to ensure that I'm really detecting a difference because of a difference in the virulence. And so that's what I did on the pyocyanin. So there is a reduction in pyocyanin production, not just because I killed the bacteria, but it's actually a change in the pseudomonas. And then uh, also when you look at how does this affect um, markers of inflammation, you can use these pseudomonas and their supernatants to stimulate um, airway epithelial cells, and you can see a decrease in the inflammation that's produced by these airway epithelial cells, um, as measured here, represented by ELISAs on EGFR phosphorylation um, and IL-8 and IL-6 production, 
um, looking at the panels um, towards the or the um, on the right hand side you can see pre phage samples and post phage samples and the reduction that happens after phage therapy And then second, um, to conclude sort of like my whole story on the type 4 pill, pill is phage therapy. So um, recall that type 4 pill is, is involved in surface attachment. And so um, this is um, one of the ways that makes um, Pseudomonas so virulent. And so I wanted to be able to, or I wanted to investigate what happens after you um, treat them with type 4 um, uh, phage therapy. And so um, to do an attachment assay, which is really, really neat, <laughs> um, and maybe I'm a nerd for saying that, but it was a really cool um, assay for me. So you take um, cells that are grown at air-liquid interface on these inserts, and then I exposed them, or I dropped in the pseudomonas that was from isolated from samples before therapy and isolated from samples after therapy, again, grown up to the same cultures. And so I, I had a starting uh, CFU inoculum that I had calculated. Um, after you put that on the air, on the cells in air-liquid interface, you culture them for one hour, and this is enough time for the pseudomonas to kind of trend down and attach to all those um, airway epithelial cells. And then you take them out of the incubator, you wash away all of the bacteria that didn't stick to the cells, you lyse the cells with a buffer, the human cells, you know, because bacteria are more resistant to our buffers because they're awesome. Um, <laughs> more or more hardy than human cells, and then you grow the, the, the cultures of the bacteria that's left over, and you can compare the CFUs from what's left over um, to what was com um, comparing that to the initial inoculum that you had used. And so um, these are the results of the attachment study. Um, so on the, the y-axis is the percentage of CFU that's left over from the initial inoculum. Um, so first I wanted to make sure that I could perform the study well, and so I used laboratory strains um, of Pseudomonas. And um, the Pseudomonas wild type is all the way over on the left-hand side. And um, about average for the attachment assays um, is um, left over is between 8 and 12%. So I was able to replicate um, what it is like in other, um, in other more proficient hands probably than mine. <laughs> Uh, and then I used two laboratory-created mutants, and so one with an insertion gene that it is unable to make type 4 pills very effectively, and another one is a processing gene that prevents it from being um, labeled to go from the Golgi apparatus to the surface, so it doesn't express the type 4 pillus very well on the cell surface. And you can see for the um, delta A and the delta Q um, that they had less attachment, so less percentage of the CFUs afterwards, which is what we would um, expect. And then um, I'll make some really... Um, interesting observations for the clinical strains, which are the four um, um, things on the right, or the clinical samples. And so for the prephage um, type 4 pillars H6, so um, sort of in the middle there, um, you can, what I would want to highlight is there's an overexpression of type 4 pillars even beyond what's seen in wild type. So these are really nasty bugs, right? Which is really um, exciting to see, or really impressive to see, I should say. Um, but when they received um, the type 4 pillus um, phage therapy as a single phage, so the, the next um, column is only a single phage um, involved therapy, it really drove down their expression of the type 4 pillus and their ability to attach to the cell surfaces. When I looked at this um, uh, subgroup analysis, on people that are on the pseudomonas that were re that received the type 4 pillars as part of a cocktail. Um, so these folks also received LPS phage at the same time as the type 4 pillars phage, or they received OMK01 and LPS at the same time. Um, I didn't see a much, there is a trend, obviously, but it was a non-significant difference between um, before and after. So to summarize and kind of um, some future directions and talking points, so phage therapy is a novel treatment for MDR and PDR infections. It's been around for a long time. It is highly effective um, at killing the bacteria and something that we can consider um, for our patients with cystic fibrosis. Um, but in addition to killing um, bacteria, phage therapy can, can be used to capitalize on these bacterial trade-offs um, to decrease bacterial virulence. And so some future directions is to investigate um, phage targets and these novel bacteria trade-offs that change bacteria virulence. And I want to be able to use this approach to investigate ways to improve our phage cocktails and to inform single or single sequential phage therapy 
um, design in order to capitalize on these benefits of decreased bacteria virulence. And I will take your questions. Okay, I'll, uh, we're waiting for questions on the app. Um, do, you, do any of these phages encode uh, genetic elements that are known to exclude super infection? So I, I wonder if the cocktail, basically you, you can't get multiple phage infections simultaneously. With a, I'm, just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, so um, are, you're saying that one phage would prevent an infection from another phage? Correct. I'm wondering if that, that yeah. is a thing. I don't think that's been shown. Um, from the work that I've read um, from, with Dr. Turner and what we have been discussing, um, what's much more likely is the fact that you have a limited dose that you provide. So the inhaled um, liquid is five milliliters. And in that, you can only put so many viruses. So you split it into two or you split it into third. And so the dose of the phage in a cocktail is actually less. And if you have less of the phage in the environment, it doesn't get in, there's a diversity in on the way that it gets into the um, pseudomonas. And then they actually, the viruses will compete to replicate inside of the pseudomonas. And so they're all trying to hijack the same system, right? And some are more effective at replicating inside pseudomonas than other ones. So they're not necessarily preventing um, each other from infecting, but, but they might be preventing how well they're killing the bacteria and what happens afterwards. Um, just using Jeopardy rules, I'll let uh, the gentleman in the audience go first. Go ahead, Dr. Singh. Yeah, thank you for that excellent question. Um, so not everybody rebounds back up to baseline. Um, but when, if and when they do, it's um, usually months um, that it takes for them to rebound. So this is a long-lasting effect um, for the majority of the patients that we're studying. And yes, we see that the patients are sensitive again. And so we have a theory that it is that pseudomonas um, that you know, has a survival benefit by changing its virulence back to more, being more virulent. And so then exp or expressing those targets again, which we can use to retreat and kind of use phage therapy as a longitudinal method of, um, of control for these infections. Um, so I'll just read the first question here. And this might, you might have sort of addressed it already mm -hmm. in the current question, but um, can you comment on the longer term clinical benefits and how durable these effects were maybe in your study and how durable you think they might be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's excellent. There's, of course, there's always patient um, variation on and how they respond and how durable the effect is. Um, but um, I would, from the knowledge of the patients that we have, um, the durability um, for some folks is years. They've only needed one phage treatment and then they get, you know, highly effective modulator therapy and, the, and all good things happen, right? Um, but uh, other folks, they have these more difficult virulent bacterial infections and more structural lung disease, right? And it's hard to get everywhere. Um, and so they're reseeding it all the time. And um, so I, env I envision that, it, you know, it's something that they'll need to get repeated treatments and it's something that we should work in and think about how we, you know, how we treat um, with inhaled antibiotic therapy every other month. And so can we alternate a month of bacteria phage in there too? Great. So the next question is uh, that you mentioned the impact of phage therapy on bacterial sensitivity to phages. Can you speak to the impact of phage therapy on sensitivity to conventional antibiotics? Yeah. So we want to make it better, right? Um, so there's no reason uh, to, to think or we hope that it's, it's not going to af affect our ability to treat with antibiotics. Um, one of the things that um, I, you know, what will always be on the lookout for is as we screen these library of phages, we want to make sure that we're not inducing something of bacterial virulence by exposing them to the phage. I can't think of a scenario when that would happen, but that would sort of be the worst case scenario, right? You could imagine giving a treatment and we would make your bacteria more virulent, sort of what antibiotics have done. Um, but the evolution between the, the viruses and the bacteria occurs so fast, and the fact that we haven't seen that before, 
I don't think that that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. The questions are getting more exciting, Gail. So I think based <laughs> on the fact that phage have been around for a long time, someone asks, are there banks of phages that we can access from the former Soviet states? <laughs> right? Uh, they're, um, they're secrets. Um, they, they don't really <laughs> divulge all of their, their banks, and so um, it's sort of like a pilgrimage for patients sometimes um, to go over there. And um, it's not, we can't guarantee that they're receiving a phage for the correct bacteria um, always, because um, they receive a broad cocktail of a bunch of different phages that might have broader host ranges and all that. So. We have a couple more. Have you, go ahead. Was there somebody with the hand raised? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, are you screening for antibiotics? Do you think that people are being infected with phage throughout their lifetime? Are you seeing any evidence for that? Yeah. So we have millions of phage already on our bodies, in our face, and in our lungs right now. Um, I can, um, that it's ubiquitous in our environment. So, yes, we are always exposed to phage. Um, our cells are not infected with phage because phages can only infect bacteria. Now, there is some sampling of phage because human cells and the immune cells will always sample their environment. So you do get antibiotic de or antibody development against phage. Um, but the fact that phage replicates, replicates so fast and, it, and it's not creating this overwhelming immune response inside the humans because it's not causing death and destruction to human cells. It's not an alarming um, mechanism, and so the antibody production is pretty minimal, and it's not enough to overcome the m vast amount of viruses in the, in the therapy, in the, in the dosage, if that okay. makes sense. So the next question we have is, can you target genes that promote uh, biofilm formation? Uh, yes, so that's part of um, targeting LPS and the type 4 pillars, which are both involved in biofilm. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe the last question, uh, do you see a role for phage in eradication? So like in pediatric, um, where they're er eradicating yeah. pseudomonas? Oh, I definitely hope so. I really do hope so. Um, and I think that, you know, those studies and trials will have to be done, um, just that they are um, in all new me new medications and they start in adults and then they go younger and younger and younger as, the, as we get comfortable with the safety profiles. And so I do hope um, that this is used in eradication. It has been used in other, um, uh, other diseases for eradication, such as infections of um, aortic graft was a, is a very provocative um, article to read of um, Dr. Chain tr treating a, a pseudomonas infected aortic graft um, and reaching eradication. So it, it definitely will need, you know, not the structural, the advanced structural lung disease because when you get that structural lung disease, it's really hard to get eradication of these um, bacteria. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you.